Andrew Hill interviewing Ron Murphy for the Muncie Labor, or Labor Oral History Project on January 11, 2006. Ron, I want to begin by thanking you for agreeing to participate in our project. And I'd like to begin with a general question that uh, I've been asking everybody that I've interviewed, and that is if you could tell me a little bit about how you and or your family happened to come to Muncie. Well, yeah. First of all, let me thank you for doing the project. Oh, appreciate I, it. I, I really think that's important. Uh, I was actually uh, born, uh, we, well, I wasn't born, I was born in Muncie, but my mother and father lived in Gaston. Okay. Uh, and we moved to Muncie when I was three years old, and we lived out in Morningside. My mother still lives there. My, my father is gone. but uh, So that's how we ended up here. My father uh, worked for 30 years at uh, Board Warner. Uh, what I know is Warner Gear, the old Warner Gear. Right. Of course, you know, then I retired out of Muncie Manual now, but it was New Venture Gear when I retired. But in my heart, it's still Chevrolet Transmission. Right. You know, worked here for so long. Uh, I, I make a quick point about, about Warner Gear, and, and uh, if you don't mind, I'll give you oh, sure. my thoughts as a yeah. kid growing up with my yeah. dad. And I had a cousin that also worked 10 or 12 years at, at Warner Gear. Uh, he went to work there in the, in the early 60s and worked 10 or 12 years. I can remember my father uh, coming home at any time because they were on a Wildcat. They had a lot of wildcats back in those, in yeah. those early days. Right. Yeah. Uh, my cousin, who worked there, like I said, 10 or 12 years, I don't know if he ever worked over six months at a time. They were notorious to be working six months, laid off six months, worked oh, six. Okay. Yeah. He actually quit there and went to work at a filling station because he wanted something full time. Yeah. He got a full time job and they called him back. He said, you know, I don't think I want to go through that again. Huh. And, and, and of course now things have improved out there yeah. a little bit. At least the majority of people. But this was a period then, just to stay with Warner Gear for a minute, where they were really fighting to negotiate their contracts. You know, I, I thinking back, uh, I remember they would walk at the drop of a hat back okay. in those days. Okay. You know, we played a different, I, ha I hesitate to say game because it, it was right. very serious, but it, right. uh, it was different in those days than versus today. Uh, back in those days, we were fighting with them tooth and nail. They hated us, we hated them. Now, I, you know, I don't mean that we hated each other as individuals, right. but right. we hated what each other but stood labor, for. Labor versus management. Yeah, it was, it, and and we went toe to toe, nose to nose, all the time. And and if we had a chance to get one up on them, we did because we knew they was going to do the same to us. And uh, and then by by the same standards of today, uh, with this global hopping economy yeah. and all of our jobs on the line, we're now trying to work with them to help run the business. Yeah. And, right. You know, it's more different today than it's ever been. So, right. but back in those days. It was a blood. It was a blood battle. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your educational background. Okay. Uh, well, I come out of Muncie Central High School. Okay. Uh, of course, I went to half a dozen schools. Yeah. I started at Rorton. Okay. I uh, went there four years, and then I got uh, somehow I don't know they tr they changed the districts. I ended up in Muncie, uh, and then ended up graduating from uh, from Muncie Central. Okay. Uh, went to Ivy Tech. Uh, in fact, I only need uh, three or four classes to have a. a computer programming degree but I didn't go there until I got laid off and I went to uh, Marion well see I got laid off in 80 or 81 and I was off like 18 months and I spent six months of that with absolutely no income whatsoever I had run out of my sub pay and I'd run out of unemployment uh, and that was back in the good old days of Ronald Reagan right, yeah. uh, and uh, then I got I got transferred so I decided I got transferred to Marion when I got back, and I, I went to Marion, and I thought, you know, I'm probably never going to get back home. And so I thought, maybe I need to be preparing for something else. So I decided that I kind of got hooked on computers. I like, kind of liked the programming aspect of it, so I started going to Ivy Tech. And I, got, I worked 18 months in Marion, and I got laid off. I was off uh, four, five, six months, and got transferred to Fort Wayne. Oh, yeah, so, and I worked... Four, almost four years at Fort Wayne. Well, here I am driving to Fort Wayne. We're working uh, nine and a half, ten hours a day, and, and you throw three hours in on the road. Right, yeah. I was going to, to my classes, but I couldn't do my homework. Right. And I said, "Yeah, this isn't working." Uh, and and so I said, "Okay, I got I got to quit till I at least get back to Muncie." And of course, uh, I got back to Muncie in '92. Uh, ran for president of my local. Well, I got to go back one step before we get to that. What, did you go into the into the uh, factory right out of high school? Yeah. Well, I graduated in '66. Okay. And went to, to work at uh, 
Chevrolet transmission in uh, 1969. Okay. So at that time, there were a lot of jobs available. Oh, you could have went anywhere. Okay. You know, uh, when I come out of high school, uh, one, you didn't have to have a high school diploma. Right. Now you do. That's all changed. And now that that's, that standard is going higher all the time. Yeah. Uh, and I keep telling these people, you, you don't wake up one of these days, you're going to have to have a degree to work at McDonald's. Right. You know, <laughs> this don't make sense to me. People forget that we still need plumbers and electricians right. and all that other stuff. But I digress. But yeah, yeah I come out of there in 69. I, I went to work. Uh, I was working for Marshes. I was their nice stock manager. And I, I got hired at Chevrolet. And, and I went to work at Chevrolet making two cents more an hour than what I was at Marshall's. Now, that gap has changed over the years, but that, sure. in 69, yeah. that's what yeah. it was. What did you do when you started out there at, at Chevy? At Chevrolet, I was, uh, my first job was the third shift. I was a machine cleaner. Okay. I worked third shift, and uh, <coughs> that didn't last very long because that was what they, some called a desired job. Of course, obviously, I got bumped quickly to, to a labor game, so I was okay. sweeping and mopping floors and pulling shavings and doing those kinds right. of things. Uh, Oh, wait a minute. Before I went there, for, when I went from Marsh to there, I went to the uh, glass factory in Dunker. Oh, okay. okay. Kerr? Is that Kerr then? The one that's still open? Yeah, that's Kerr. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My brother was working there, and he's still there, in fact. Okay. Uh, and I went up there and worked uh, probably close to a year, I suppose. And then Chevrolet called me. What did you do at the glass factory? I was con I, I assumed they would, I don't remember the official title, yeah. but I, it was a conveyor attendant. I, okay. I, boxed and then I went over and I drove fork truck and uh, I just did a variety of Okay. Of so you went back when you're at Chevy, did you have a succession of different jobs there then as you as you moved up in terms of seniority? Well there were some there'd be some people tell you I didn't have many jobs but <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> ruling them out. Yeah right. Uh, yeah I uh, uh, when I went to work in Chevy in uh, March of 69 I only worked uh, three or four months I got laid off. Okay. No, I didn't. No, I didn't even work three months. Didn't get my seniority because my seniority date was adjusted. I got laid off. I thought, Man, I ain't like this. So I went back to the glass factory. Oh, okay. Now the glass factory, you could work 20 hours a day. 20. Oh, you could work all the time you want. In the summertime, yeah. and I, just, I almost messed this up. But in the summertime, they hired high school students and cut out the overtime because they could get them for almost nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So this was summertime. You know, I went up there and they were hiring high school students. And I, because I told him, I said, guys, if you give me some more overtime, because I got called back, I said, I'm going to go back. Yeah. If you just give me the overtime, well, that was yeah. the dumbest thing I could have said, but yeah. thank God they said, Murph, we can't give it to you now. And I said, well, you know, I'm sorry, I got to go where the yeah. money's at. So I, I come back, thank goodness. And and I did. My goal was to, to become a machine operator. Oh, okay. And actually, at, at, at that particular point in time, uh, my father, you know, I told you worked toward a year, yeah. was never active in the union never was really very active yeah. and uh, my goal was probably to to uh, become a, a member of management okay oh okay uh, that's where i was when i went yeah. in there and I, so i was wanting to progress okay. and and i we had what we call mog and mos uh, mos was a different they were just they were both machine operators okay. and they were above they paid more than labor right and mos just paid a nickel more because you had to okay. change your own tools okay okay an mog you didn't have to change any tools you just stuck the part in and run them and, and an MOS, yeah. had, I think it was Nickel Moore. And well, you mentioned that your dad wasn't really involved in the union at Gear. Why did you get involved so much in the union? Because I didn't like what I saw when I went in there. Okay. They did not treat people well. Okay. They did not. I had a, uh, a couple of supervisors that, well, they were just a couple of biggest liars I ever seen in my life. Okay. I mean, they stand like you. If you knew that it was, that it was what they were telling you, could not be true. And, and, and I'm saying, I'm, I don't understand this, okay. you know, uh, and and they just didn't treat people right. Yeah. And uh, an opportunity come along because I was only there a year, and an opportunity come along to run as an alternate committeeman. Oh, okay. So I I went up and ran. And that was when the old 287 had their union hall down here in South Long yeah, Street. Sure. Yeah. And we rented off of them, and because I remember when I ran, they said, "Wait a minute, because you had to be there a year to run." They had to go and check my records to see if I'd <laughs> been there a year. Come back, said, "Yep, he can run." So I I was elected as alternate committeeman, and. Uh, then the following year, I ran as committeeman and beat an old timer. And that, so you were involved in union activities from that point on. Right. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. I was uh, went through the committeeman. I went up. I was a zone committeeman. Uh, I was there in the, in the uh, bargaining. I'm going to take 10, 11 years, 12 years, whatever. Yeah. And 
because I eventually went, I was on second shift, but I eventually went to days and ran on days, and so I was committee went on days too, and, and that's a, you know, days and second, and there's two different worlds, and, and third shift's a different world again, but. Why, tell me a bit, a bit more about that. What's different? Well, your whole lifestyle's different. Okay. If you work second shift, the only thing you do is work and sleep. Oh, okay. I mean, that's all you do. By the time you get home, because we always worked uh, till 11.30 or 12 o'clock. We go in 3, 3.30, you know. You can't go home to bed. Your family's already in bed. Yeah. You know, so you, you have a snack and you watch TV for a couple hours, and then you don't get up till 10, 11 o'clock. Yeah. You know, you got an hour or two, maybe you got to start getting yeah. ready to go back to work. Yeah, my father-in-law did that at Scott Paper in Detroit. So all you do is work and sleep yeah. on second shift. You got no kind of life at all. Yeah. Now, third shift uh, is, I, uh, I was on third shift before I ran for president as my favorite shift. But you can't sleep. Third, third shift is what time to what time? Uh, we went in at 10 or 10.30. Got off about 6.30 in okay. the morning. Uh, I was tired all the time. You were just tired all the time. You can't ever get enough sleep. Yeah. Your body is not yeah. meant to do that, you know? Were the number of people on those shifts pretty equal? No. Okay. No. You're, you're well, that will vary from corporation to corporation. In my well, plan, talking about Chevrolet. The Chevrolet, the largest group by far was on day shift. Okay. And then the second largest was on second. Third shift was a skeleton crew, depending on what they need to pick up and cover. Oh, okay. Yeah. The only thing we ever rarely ran pretty steady was maintenance and, and heat treat. Oh, okay. Now, you could depend on them running no matter yeah. what. Right. Because you couldn't shut down the furnace. Right. You know, right. that's it. <laughs> so, those are the things. That, and, yeah. and then we did a lot of maintenance at night. Okay. Uh, when did you become president? 1993. Three. Okay. 1993. So I, well, I said I'd come back in 92, I'd come back in 91. Because yeah. okay. I read President. Well, I want you to reflect a little bit on what kinds of things did the union do? I mean, one of the things that interests me in this project is how did unions actually operate? You know, how did they really function, you know, kind of a day to day, month to month, year to year? What really went on? Oh gosh, there's a lot of things that went on okay. that people don't even realize. And, and, yeah. and but you know, most people don't really care. You know, the apathy yeah. is, is so great within our union membership that it's pathetic. You mean now or then? Then and now. Oh, okay. Yeah, then and now. <laughs> because they'll tell you yeah. the union. The you wait a minute. That's you. Yeah, that's right. No, that's you. Yeah. No, no wait a minute, I'm not, I'm just yeah. I represent it. You make up the union, right. and most people don't realize that. Uh, but but we're very democratic. Yeah. Most people will not. Most of our members don't know that yeah. because they don't come to the union meetings. Yeah. You know, we uh, depending you got to you got to address your union meetings in such a manner yeah. to get enough people to come to have a quorum. Right. Oh, what a, yeah. what a pity! What yeah. a pity! <laughs> but you know, people when we when we negotiate, for an example, yeah, we collect what we call demands. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we ask our membership, submit us yeah. what, what do you, you what want. Do you want? Okay. What do you want? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then they submit them to us, and we have to. We have a committee that goes together. Of course, our bargaining committee right. goes together, and they go through them, and you got duplications. They're worded differently. Right. You got to make sure, you know, does this mean the same as this? And, yeah. and, and then what's the best way to word it? Then we, we, we try to put it together to go forward. And before we do, we take it back to the membership okay. and say, this is what we come up with. And, and we let them approve those. Okay. Uh, again, you got 25, 30 people that's yeah. doing this process. And uh, so then once it's approved, uh, then the bargaining committee takes it forward and negotiates the contract. Okay. How, how much of that is governed by national UAW as, in terms of what you're doing right here in Muncie, Indiana at one UAW plant with one UAW local? Okay. The national level, just to make it real simple, does uh, retirement, wages, those kinds of things are all set at the national level. Okay. <coughs> you know, we had a, our original contract was one page. Right. And now we got 14 books and they're that yeah. thick. I mean, yeah. uh, but at the local level, we're, we're dealing with health and safety issues. Okay. And, that, are, and that are specific to this plan. To this plan, okay. yeah. We're dealing with things that are specific to this plan. Uh, so we deal with a lot of different things. Okay. So uh, you negotiate those kinds of things locally. Yes. And then what I call the big stuff, like how much per hour, pensions, health care, that's all done. That's all done to national level. All done to national level. We do here locally uh, layoffs. Oh, okay. 
how things are to be laid off, whether it be a temporary or permanent layoff, they're handled differently. Uh, we do how we, uh, how we bid on jobs, yeah. upgrade if we want to go and how we one, one of the things that someone said to me, but not on tape, and I know you can tell me how this works, but it's a phrase that I think the general public isn't familiar with, and that's something called a job bank. Mm -hmm. how, how does a job bank work? Well, a job bank is not that old, but it's not something that I can, that I am real familiar with. But I can tell you this: under the GM contract, uh, going back, right. we had what we called sub. A sub is a, a, a supplemental. It's a supplemental agreement to supplement our income, and it was based on the, it, we get 90 percent of our take-home pay minus $17.50 for instance difference. Okay. So you go up and you get unemployment. Let's say you were making 600 bucks a week. Okay. okay. If you go up and you and you sign up for unemployment and you're getting $200 a week, right? Then they'll figure out what that 95 percent minus 1750 will be. Okay. They'll deduct the 200. Okay. That's your sub payment. Okay. So you're getting an unemployment check. You're getting yeah. a sub payment. Right. Uh, it's not. And I don't. I don't mean this the bad way. It's the greatest thing we ever had. Yeah. Uh, but people think it's. It's, we're just rolling in the, in the mud, but we're not. Right. It's it's survival money. Yes, yeah, it's survival money is all it is. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we had what we called subcredits, 52 subcredits. Oh, okay. And I remember back in the 80s when I was laid off, sub depending upon the level of the sub fund is how many credits they take out. Okay. So when the sub fund was full, and I got laid off yeah. after I served a waiting week, I could draw a check they do that to subcredits, so I could draw for 52 weeks. Okay. Well, as the sub fund reaches lower in level, they would have, I mean, I was taking, there were times they took three or four subgrades for one check. Because yeah. the money wasn't there. Yeah. Obviously, if you don't have the money, you, you know. Yeah. So that's why we right ran out back in the East, because everybody in the world was laid off, all over the country. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just here, it was everywhere. So what, so the bank comes in in the 90s? or? The yeah, the bank come in, in in the 90s, because we have what we call in our agreements, and it's a security agreement for our members, that. See that? This is a confusing part to me because I've never been in a bank. I've okay. never dealt with a bank because I was on the administrative right. side, so I didn't deal with it. But people that get laid off can only be laid off for so long, okay. and then they're brought back into a job bank. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, if I understand correctly, and I could be wrong, but I think the people in the job bank then can replace people on the floor who are used for training purposes yeah, and yeah, that, that, other yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, that, that, yeah. That's, that's the way it was explained to me, but I want to try and get some of that on tape. Well, we also have what we call GIS, Guaranteed Income Stream, okay. which is for our contract, bank closings and stuff. Yeah. Uh, my plant being one that's going to close could fall into this, yeah. uh, unless they've changed it since I've been gone, and that's possible. Right. So, yeah. But GIS was if you had less than 10 years seniority didn't qualify, with 10 years, uh, okay, with 15 years, you had to have 15 years of seniority to be laid off, 10 years if it was a plant closing. And you were guaranteed after your sub and everything run out, you're guaranteed 50 percent of your income. Okay, how long? I think it could go forever until they found you a job. Oh, okay. Oh, those okay. Like they could say, well, we got a job in Marion, we got a job in I don't know Arkansas. We only well, have to, all they got to do is find you a job. Well, and I think you turned down two of them. Oh, okay. okay. But it could be any place. They could send you to Moscow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. That, that works. That works. Um, during your career at Chevrolet. How would you describe the relationship between management and labor? And I'm particularly interested in whether or not it changed over time. Oh, oh, oh. changed like night and day. Okay, well, talk a bit about that. And, and, and going back in the early days when I was a committeeman, everything, as I said, uh, yeah. was very adversarial. Okay. We uh, we hated each other. And I don't mean that literally, yeah. but I mean that, that we were fighting at over anything. Yeah. We would fight over anything. And that has changed today to where we're trying to help run the business. Our jobs are on the line. Yeah, right. You know, and I try to tell everybody, you know, don't, because co companies still hate unions, they still fight unions. Yeah. Don't fight them. Let them help you. Work with them. Right. And there's no better end to the employees because yeah. these these people that are elected are usually leaders from within the the yeah. group, yeah. and there's no better way to work together. Okay. And well, we, nobody knows our jobs better than we do. Did, did you, as you look back on. The entire time you're at Chevrolet, did you were you off a lot because of strikes, whether they're regularly called strikes or wildcats? No, no. Uh, I was off in uh, in 1970. That was 
was our last big one. Uh, I was off, I think, 10 or 11 weeks, but there were a lot of people that were off 12. I was an alternate commander. I got elected alternate commander tonight, so I got I got called back a week or two prior to everybody else. But there were people I think were off 12 weeks. It was a tough time. And then, but that was the last strike we've had out there. Okay. Well, let me let me go back to one other point about that. When you had Muncie Chevrolet, regardless of what it was called, really going great, really going full bore, three shifts. How many guys worked out there? Two over three thousand. Three thousand. So that's the second largest. Plant in Muncie. I'm assuming gear was large. Yeah, they had, I think, at one time a little over seven. Oh, okay, seven. Okay, no, I thought it was a little bit smaller than that. So these two places for people to get jobs, and these were good jobs. Yes. Were the two largest employers in this community. Yes. Okay. You have any idea how many people are working full time at Chevrolet now? About 375. Okay. As captain management. Okay. And you mentioned, you know, I'm moving ahead of my story here, but you mentioned. The closing. I mean, is is that plant scheduled to be closed as we speak sometime in the next few months? March. Okay. March, April. And so they'll just shut it down, and there'll be nothing out there. Well, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. Okay. And the reason I say that is because I have seen the UAW and General Motors agree, in because General Motors will come forward, and they'll say we're going to close five plants. And, and, and through the course of negotiations, they'll agree not to close anymore. Oh, okay. But then they get a hair up their butt and they say, okay, we're going to close this one over here. Okay. So what they do, they go in and lay all the people off except 15, oh, okay. keep a skeleton crew, and they'll keep it open until the next contract and say, we're going to close this one. Oh, okay. So this one here may not close officially. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. The work's going to be gone in March. But there's going to be work to do to uh, be moving the machinery out. Uh, okay. God knows what, because they're getting ready to tear the building down, from what I have been told. Oh, yeah. That's going to be torn down probably later in the summer. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, they may keep a, a handful of people, so. But the work's gone. Yeah. There won't be any more than a handful of people, I don't uh, think. Two, two classic history questions. Uh, one. Be careful, I flunked history. Well, I want you to know, <laughs> you, you know this, and, and I think it's important to get it on tape. You, this is to you and to me because I came to Muncie in late 1960s, Chevrolet Muncie. Yes. But you, but you mentioned all these name changes. Can you take me through the name changes and when those occurred and what that really meant? Well, I, I don't know that I can remember them all, but I know okay. we were CPC. We well, were what's CPC? Uh, Cadillac, Pontiac, Chevrolet Cadillac, see, Chevrolet Pontiac Cadillac Division. Okay. We were part of Hydromatic. Okay. Uh, see, I know there were a couple more. Well, you mentioned new venture gear and stuff like that. I mean, when, when do those things come in? Because every time I drive by there, it seems to have a different name. Yeah, and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you more because <laughs> these names that I just mentioned yeah. really didn't mean anything. Okay. All it meant was was a transfer of power within a GM structure. Okay. <laughs> and they were layered and layered and layered with fat cats. And, yeah. You know, so this is happening back in Detroit. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. It really didn't mean squat that. Okay. All it meant was we now answer to a different boss in Detroit. Okay. okay. Uh, New Venture Gear is different okay. because New Venture Gear was the first joint venture that any of the big three put together. Oh, okay. And we became part of, of, of our own corporation called New Venture Gear. Right. Our plant was involved. We had a sister plant in Syracuse, New York, right. that was a Chrysler plant. So this venture oh, okay. was with Chrysler. Okay. okay. I think our plant in, in there was called New Process. I believe it was. Do you remember when New Venture Gear, when that name came in? It was about 1980, 80, okay. or uh, no, because uh, I was gone. Yeah. yeah, it was in the early 80s. Okay, early, 80s. Er, early 80s, that's okay. as close as I can get you. Okay. Uh, and it lasted uh, probably 11, 12 years. Okay, then what? Then what was it called? Uh, went back to Muncie Manual. Muncie Manual. Yeah, it's Muncie Manual now, and it's back to GM. It's back to GM. It's okay. back to GM ownership. Okay. Well, this is the, the big macro question, which you know full well. Just for the record, historical record, what did they really make out there? Manual transmissions. Only? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, we have tried to dabble in different things through the year, and it just didn't work. Okay. Uh, we bid on even automatics, but our plant was too dirty, and just for a lot of different reasons we weren't set. But we were excellent. Make no mistake about this. We were excellent gear cutters. 
okay. We had guys out there that really knew geometry and all that kind of, I mean, they were excellent gear cutters. They did it, did it well. Was this, was this the biggest or one of the biggest manual transmission plants in the whole GM network? We may have been at one time. Okay. Yeah, we may have been at one time. Okay. What do you think unions have done for workers? Okay. That's a good question. You know, and, I, and again, I'm going to back you up a little well, that's bit fine. here. That's why we're because doing this. If the unions have a single purpose, if I had to define the purpose of unionism and the labor movement, I will tell you and I will tell anybody, our goal is to better the standard of living for every single American, not only our own members, but we are particularly, if you see us up there in lobbying in Washington, what are we, we're not only lobbying for our issues, right. well, when minimum wage hits the table, yeah. and, and I think it was Dick Army in, in uh, Texas that said, why do they care? Yeah. And I talk to our people all the time, so, well, you know, why do we care? I'll tell you what, because it's, it's a right thing to do. You know, we, we're trying to improve that. And, and if you go back through the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, and you saw, and history, I think, will prove me right. You saw standard of living oh, yeah. for every single American on the rise. Yeah. You also saw unions increasing in membership. There were more of us. There were more unions. There were more kinds of unions. Sure. And we were growing as well. And then along come late 70s, early 80s, and, and things begin to change. And now we're kind of declining. What do you see in the, in the economy? I mean, as far as our people, we're declining too. Now, is that... Some people tell you that's just coincidence. I don't believe that. I believe we played a big role in improving the standard of living for every single American. So it would it be fair for me to say, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. Was that answer okay? Yes, but the unions, especially in the big three automobile companies, steel workers, teamsters, all of the big unions in America, UAW, or the United Mine Workers is another example. These unions and the contracts they negotiated enabled people to enter the American middle class. Oh. And those kinds of opportunities have decreased significantly in the last 10, 15 years. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay. That's absolutely fair. You see the paper, the, the statistics in the paper about the gap is widening between the haves and the have-nots. The middle class is shrinking. Statistics have proven that out. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah. Okay, that's a good point. What do you think are some of the disadvantages of unions. You know, being fair. <laughs> well, I don't know that, that that I will tell you and I will tell anybody that I think the union dues that we pay is the best insurance policy that you can buy. Okay. Absolutely the best. You know, we buy car insurance, we buy life insurance, right. we buy all this other shit and we say, yeah. hope I never need it. Yeah. Yeah. When you pay a monthly dues into that union dues, yeah. you're getting something out of it every day. You're not only getting represented, you're getting uh, people negotiating for you, you're getting increased wages and increased pensions. Sure. So you're getting, I don't know if there is a disadvantage. Okay. You, you don't think that in the larger picture that, there are two parts of this I want to ask you about, that, uh, that one, that unions push too far and got too much? There's some, you know, yeah. Yeah, I, if I was being honest with you, I will tell you, yeah. Okay. I'll give you a prime example. Anderson. Indiana at one time had 30,000 UAW members, right. had 17,000 in one plant. Yeah. Huge. They were a very yeah. strong union. Yeah. They made a, lar a lot of different components for a car. If they was to go on strike, they could literally shut GM yeah. down. Yeah. Now, GM ain't no dummy. Yeah. You know, they ain't no dummy. They're sitting there thinking, yeah. we got to figure out a way to get around this. Yeah. So the, this this whole plan has been laid out by some brilliant guy. Oh, yeah. I don't right. like him whoever he is, but <laughs> but he's a brilliant guy, and yeah. you got to give him credit. Okay. And that's how they begin to 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 yeah. break us up. Okay. But yeah, I think we did. You know, you got to have checks and balances. Yeah. And right now, what we're seeing is it's it's swaying too far the other way. These we found out, and of course I never had any doubt these corporations haven't changed them. They're greasy. They're greedy and things haven't changed a bit. And I think you're going to see, uh, I, I never thought I would live to see it, but uh, with Moosh in office, maybe I shouldn't say that, but we can't we're, well, we're getting closer to, to reality because he's, he's killing us. Oh, yeah. and, and we're getting closer to, there's going to be some more yeah. uh, to swing that back the other way. So there's going to, the American people are not going to stand for this forever. Yeah, it's, it's a pendulum. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. I think we may have swung a hair too far. 
and uh, now we're swinging back a hair too far the other way, and, and it'll be back. You know, I don't think, as Charlie said, we'll ever see it as as we know it. Right. But it will swing back. Yeah. It will swing back. Okay. Uh, two, what I call kind of social issues. What what role did race play in your union? Was that an important factor as far as the role of African Americans? Uh, it played a very important role. And one of the, one of the things that I am the, the most proud of, that when you go back into the 60s when Martin Luther King was uh, making some of his marches, if you can dig out some pictures, and I, if, I don't have them, but the Union Hall's got them, yeah. you will see Walter Ruther and other oh, yeah, UAW sure. leaders, oh, yeah. other AFL leaders walking hand in hand. Yeah. We, uh, we played a great role in, in the Civil Rights Movement, yeah. and I am very, very proud of that. Yeah. Uh, now doesn't mean that your local unions don't have problems, because right. yeah. we did. Okay. Uh, when I was president, we had Ed Walker, who was a chairman of our Civil Rights Committee, and, and he was a great guy. Uh, he was also head of the NAACP in Henry County, right. and uh, we tried to work very, very closely together to, okay. to, to, to work on some stuff, yeah. you know. And, and so we played a big role in that. I will also tell you, you didn't ask this question, the UAW was the first the first union to demand equal pay, for equal work for all minorities, whether you be African American right. or a woman, right. female. We didn't win it that first time, right. but we got it yeah. eventually. We also got my second question because I wanted to a ask you, what role did women play in union activities when you were involved with uh, 499? Okay, uh, that's a good question because when I first went in there, we had a handful of Rosies. World War II ladies right. had been there, and it was only a handful. Yeah. Uh, and then we began to hire women uh, in, the, in the early to mid-70s. Uh, we began to hire quite a few women. There was quite a uh, controversy about this because they were, they were, you know, some tried to say, well, women's got to have a sit-down job. You know, they can't do this. It's too heavy. And <laughs> yeah. so, you know, there was a lot of different arguments coming. But uh, today, they do it all. I mean, today it's that that issue is gone. But there was, yeah. you know, working at. at no, I won't go there. But there was a lot of <laughs> no, there were a lot of other. Well, problems. it's a tough question because you know one of the things that uh, came about during my interview with uh, Ruby Beavers, when I asked her if she could tell me the names of any other women who played roles in the unions here in Muncie, as she did. The she probably said, no. She said no. No, I couldn't either. <laughs> I, said, well, yeah. okay. I said, well, I guess I'm going to be looking in vain. Huh? She said, yeah, you're going to be looking in vain. Yeah, they're, they're just it's not there. It's an exercise in futility. Yeah, they're not yeah. there. Uh, but, but in all justification to them, there was only a handful. I'm sure Borg Warner was the same way. Yeah, oh yeah. Our work was, because our work has changed over the years. Yeah. Our work has become more automated over the years. Yeah. Uh, our work back then, you had to, to load them by hand, you had to chuck them by hand. Uh, and so it was a lot harder, a lot heavier yeah. than it is today with the use of the automation technique and stuff. This, so. this is a little bit beyond you in dates, but you can see what I'm getting at. And I've been asking everybody this question as kind of a, my final formal question. When I came to Muncie in the late 1960 you now to join the Ball State faculty, a friend of mine who had lived here for a while said, gee, Warren, you better understand when you go to Muncie, Indiana, that's a really rough, tough union town. Do you think that was an accurate description when you started out working? You bet you. Okay. Wow. You what, what do you think this guy really meant? Rough, tough union town. We had for years, uh, and we had too, uh, we had a bad reputation. Okay. Uh, as one who would strike your ass in a heartbeat, you know. And uh, we had to work hard to overcome that because they didn't want to bring work in. Oh, okay. You know, they didn't want to, uh, to start with it was hard to get new corporations to, to come to Muncie. And it was hard for us to bring new work in because yeah. of our reputation that, that we may be tough to get along with. Okay. And we probably were. You know, uh, I have no doubt that we earned that. Okay. And, and the reason I say that is because my memory as a kid was my dad yeah. uh, and the, all the wildcats they had. Now, we've never had a wildcat while we was a, well, I worked there. But, yeah. you know, I could go back as a kid and remember that. So I, I think we've earned that reputation. Okay. I know of plants, and I, I, I regret to say this, that... that who would go on strike and do things that I wouldn't be very proud of. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they would break a window here yeah. and there and yeah. do things yeah. like that. And, uh, so the reputation was a deserved one. I think it was. Okay. But but as you reflect yeah. back, and now you're in a leadership position with Labor and Muncie, 
that's really changed a lot for a variety of reasons. Yes. Okay, so that, I mean, you wouldn't hear people today saying Muncie's a rough, tough union. Then. No, no, I don't think so. Yeah. In fact, uh, we've worked hard to uh, uh, convey the, that we're willing to work with you. We have a great labor force uh, ready to go to work, and, and we'll work with you and, okay. and help you in any way we can. Okay. Well, those are all the formal questions I have, but at the end of each of my interviews, I give the person I'm interviewing an opportunity to add anything that he wishes. And so here's your chance to be on the record for posterity in the archives of Ball State University. Anything else you want to add? Okay. Uh, I, I want to, you know, you were talking about the, the early days. Yeah. Uh, when I was in there as a committee, when I spent uh, 10, 12 years as a committee. And, I, and when, I, when I talk to groups today, I, I tell everybody, you know, I spent half my time trying to prove I was right. And, and the difference between today is who the hell cares? You know, who cares who said this or who did that? The bottom line is if we've got a problem, how are we going to fix it? Just don't waste the time. Let's, let's take our heads together and figure out what we're going to do to resolve the issues. And that's the difference between then and there and now. And, and, and like I said, we work. Uh, one of my, my greatest joys, my, my personal pleasures uh, as a labor liaison is I go everywhere. I go to the boardroom. Sure. I mean, there is not a top executive in town I don't know. Right. I can't call them up and say, I need to talk to you. Yeah. And, and they would not, because I have that respect for them. Yeah. And I have the respect that, that for, to them or for them right. that, that we're going to be able to sit down and, and work things out. Yeah. And I've, I've worked with the chamber. Uh, Joe Evans is another good one that has worked with the chamber. And uh, I remember when we first started doing it, a lot of guys said, Murphy, why do you do that? They hate us. Yeah. I said, well, I don't know if they hate us. I have a very good relationship with Dan Allen. Yeah, sure. Uh, I really do. Uh, and I said, we may have some different philosophies on stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. But if we're not there to tell them yeah. what our point of view is, they will never know. Yeah, that's so, true. So things have changed drastically yeah. over the years. I, I am proud of, of uh, where we're, because like I said, you know, we were tough. We've had to work to overcome that, and I'm proud of where we're at. I'm just not happy to see things continuing to erode for working men and women. It's going to be an uphill battle for us. I don't think anybody in this world can live on $10 an hour. And senior, you know, you definitely can't retire, you can't send your kids to college, right. and those kinds of things. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, we got to work to get it back. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you coming in and taking time to do this, buddy.